And that's only after one cup of coffee. I got one here. There you go. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Well, we certainly want to thank all of you for joining us this morning. Um, apparently, uh, you're as interested in the subject of uh, reactionary bio defense as we are. And we've got a uh, quite a few panelists today that uh, are going to help us sort our way through this. And so we're grateful to have your presence here. You know, I think one of the things that we've understand, unfortunately, particularly in a democracy, is uh, we have a tendency in this country to react to things after they occur. I can say I'm someone who's spent a time most of my life in public service. You don't get too much. Public servants are not lauded or applauded by standing up saying, we anticipated this problem 10 years or 15 years hence. We're going to act today to avoid the crisis tomorrow. It just doesn't happen. We wish it would, and maybe one of these days will change, but it doesn't happen. And some form of these issues turn into crises, and I think Americans sometimes have fooled themselves into thinking, well, we're pretty good, so if it happens, we'll be able to respond quickly and effectively to it. And oftentimes, we learn after the event occurs, we weren't as prepared as we could have been. It's like that, I forget what that commercial was, pay me now, pay me later. Uh, we need to be a lot more preemptive rather than reactive, um, but we're not there yet. And I'd also like to think, as I speak for my colleagues on both sides of the aisle, it's not necessarily good governance to wait until a crisis occurs, although, unfortunately, that seems to be the norm. The panel is pleased to see, you know, we've been at this for three years. We're very grateful that the White House took one of our primary recommendations to create a comprehensive strategy for biodefense seriously. Uh, they not only released the National Biodefense Strategy about three weeks ago, uh, I think Bob Cadillac talked a lot of this, and they actually have an execution plan, an implementation plan that we look forward to working with them. So again, when we all took this on, all six members, we said we didn't want to be part of a study that gathered dust. We wanted to be part of a study with a short and long term policy recommendations, and let's build the capacity to get them, get Congress to react and the executive branch to react, and we're grateful that the White House laid that out. And as a side note, we know Bob Cadillac had a critical role in all that. He's been a, pushing this initiative for well over a decade. So we're, uh, kind of reminds me of uh, one of my favorite agencies in the federal government, Coast Guard, I don't know if you've got any family in the Coast Guard. I think it's the most underappreciated. But they've got this motto called Semper Paratus. Semper Paratus means always ready. And we think a defense strategy, a comprehensive strategy, will put us on that path, hopefully, to be always ready down the road. I was in the White House for a very few days when the anthrax events occurred 17 years ago. And while we did not have the benefit of a strategy back then, we were somewhat prepared, but not completely. CDC, FBI, state and local labs, others were working on a process to put in place to help to respond to bioterrorism events, but uh, that, was, uh, that shook up the nation. After 9-11, then the anthrax, and everybody was waiting for the next form of attack. Well, we got some experts who were involved with those early preparedness efforts. All three responded to the anthrax attacks of 2001. Dr. Scott Lillybridge, Dr. Doug Anders, and uh, Dr. Andrew Cannons today. We're grateful for their presence and very interested in their testimony. I can remember, ladies and gentlemen, a press conference where a re journalist said, well, it was the anthrax that was in Senator Daschle's office or in the media office, or was it weaponized? You know, and weaponized is a very unique term. You gotta mill those spores down so they can hang suspended in the air so you can inhale them over time, and I'm not the, wasn't the brightest light bulb in the chandelier when it comes to whether it's a weaponized or non-weaponized anthrax, but all I know is that if it was your loved one that got killed, it was a weapon, and we lost five people during that incident. So we're going to hear from those who responded to it. We also look forward to hearing from Dr. Rappaport from Tulane. There had been an accidental release of Burkholdia which is an interesting pathogen down in Louisiana, and they 
particularly uh, those who have uh, weak immune systems, those who have chronic lung disease, it creates a problem, but it was a pathogen, and frankly, the federal government's response wasn't very, very effective, and we're anxious to hear from him. So we got a couple questions today. We'd like to find some answers. We think the panelists will do it. Uh, what were the problems before the anthrax incident? And uh, let's be honest with ourselves, have we fixed them? Have we built on whatever those fixes were back in 01, 02, and 03? And where are we today in terms of uh, preparedness for this kind of incident? And we're gonna have the benefit of someone we all admire greatly, Dr. Tara O'Toole, She's going to come back today and address this and talk to us about the future of biodefense. So we've got a full program, and I'm going to turn to my co-chair of the panel, my friend and colleague, Senator Lieberman, to make a few remarks. Go. Thanks. <clears throat> thanks very much, uh, Governor, and uh, thanks to everybody uh, for being here. Um, this is, uh, as Tom said, uh, this is a significant point in our own uh, deliberations and our own activities because... Uh, the administration did uh, issue, since our last public meeting, a national biodefense strategy, which we recommended and Congress was uh, good enough to uh, mandate. Uh, took the administration a while longer than we hoped, but it came out with it, and, and we think it's a, it's a strong uh, document, and no more perfect than anything else that uh, anybody does, particularly the government. But you know, to have the federal government do something these days is really a, a good thing. <laughs> and uh, so we think it's a significant uh, step forward and one we're grateful for and want to build on. Uh, I, I was uh, honored to be asked to be involved in this when we started out and particularly to join with uh, Tom Ridge uh, and, and others on the commission. It's a small commission, only six. We're, uh, we benefit from the ex officios over there who actually know what they're talking about, and uh, they enrich the work of the panel. Uh, but I, I felt from the beginning, and, and my uh, feeling about this has been deepened since we've been at work, that we have a mission here, um, which is, to a certain extent, be 21st century Paul Revere's, and in this case, to warn our government, and to the extent we can, the American people, that uh, a bioterrorist attack is coming, when we don't know, and uh, another uh, infectious disease pandemic is also coming. We don't know, but we can uh, say with a reasonable certainty uh, that both uh, uh, events, uh, awful events, will occur. And the question is, how do we, uh, how do we determine to the best of our ability when they're about to occur, how do we prevent them? And if we're unable to prevent them, how do we uh, organize to respond as uh, quickly as possible to them? Uh, the bottom line is we, we don't think we're ready. And the, and the title that um, we've given to this uh, meeting today uh, says it all, Fits and Starts Reactionary Biodefense. Um, we, we've got we to get ahead of the threat. We can't we cannot just be uh, reactionary, and uh, we hope uh, that this really extraordinary group of witnesses we have before us today will um, help us do that, help us go to the, uh, the next level. We do begin with um, our, a member of the panel, Senator Tom Daschle, and we begin with a look back at uh, the anthrax attacks of 2001 following the terrorist attack of 9-11. What can you say? Fear, as they say, is a great motivator, and there was tremendous fear after 9-11 and after the anthrax attacks, which uh, generated a lot of uh, activity in the field of biodefense. But I'm afraid um, that certainly with regard to a bioterrorist attack, uh, the, the fear level is down. And this is when a group like this has to continue to be vigilant and persuasive about uh, about getting ready and, and creating a preventive system. Um, the, the anthrax attacks of 2001 affected us in Connecticut. There was a lady named Otilly Lundgren who was 94 who, um, who died uh, from inhalational anthrax in November 
of 2001. She, she wasn't a, directly a target. She died as a result of cross-contamination of her mail because the original letters with the anth anthrax in them that went to Tom Daschle and others were mailed using our postal system. So to think that this good lady in her 90s died doing something as normal as going through her mail is, is both tragic and uh, profoundly uh, unsettling. Four other people died as a result of the <clears throat> anthrax events of 2001, and 17 others were infected after exposure, but, but obviously it could have been uh, far worse. And so uh, 17 years later, we want to go back and, and look at uh, those events and what's happened since. And we're very fortunate that uh, Senator Tom Daschle uh, is going to be our leadoff uh, witness. Uh, his office, as you know, received an anthrax letter uh, 17 years ago, and um, he's really been personally involved in biodefense ever since as part of a broader life commitment to public service. Tom served in the U.S. House of Representatives for eight years and the U.S. Senate for another 18. I had the privilege and the pleasure of serving with him in the Senate for 16 of those years. Uh, he was a great legislator. He was a great leader. And um, um, I'm fortunate to say he became a great friend. Uh, Tom continues to help shape U.S. and global policy in many uh, significant ways. And um, uh, it's really a pleasure to call on him now to uh, begin this hearing. Tom. Well, Joe, thank you very much for that overly generous introduction. And let me thank both uh, our co-chairs for setting the stage and setting the tone for this important day and, uh, and for providing the leadership on the Blue Ribbon Study panel that they have. It's just been a pleasure to work with both of them and, and uh, I've uh, admired both uh, for a long time and I have many more reasons to, uh, to extend my admiration as a result of this experience. I, I'm sure we can all pick days throughout our lives that we remember with great clarity uh, as vividly as if they had happened yesterday. Uh, certainly 9-11 is that kind of a day. The day John Kennedy was shot is another day that I recall quite vividly. But October 16th, 2001 was one of those days for me. Uh, a month and five days after 9-11. I, uh, for the first time in my life, uh, during that month between 9-11 and the anthrax attack, I acquired a migraine headache that was quite severe, and I began to get more and more worried that it might be more than just a headache. And so the morning of October 16th, I went to NIH for my first MRI. I'd never had one before. Uh, very nervous, very concerned that uh, I was going to be told that there was something of consequence behind my migraine. and went through the test and uh, the, shortly thereafter, as I waited for the results, was told that uh, I had nothing to worry about, that I was totally clean and it was just the tension, the pressure and all of the pain that came from lack of sleep and all the anxiety after 9-11. Uh, and so I arrived at my office exuberant and just as thrilled as I could be, having just been given this great medical report, only to be experienced my chief of staff, whose name was Pete Rouse at the time, crashed into the room just as boldly. I mean, the door just open, flung open, and he said, we've got a problem. And he said, uh, one of our interns over in the Hart building, I was, there, I was in the leader building uh, at the time, the leader office, I should say, which is just off the Senate floor. And every senator has office space allocated through one of the three office buildings, either the Russell, the Dirksen, or the Hart building. I had always had my Senate office in the Hart Building on the fifth floor, and uh, an intern had just opened uh, the envelope, uh, an aerosolized anthrax, or they, they weren't quite sure that's what it was, but uh, it had just exploded in front of her. There were 28 people in the room, and so they immediately shut down the office, closed the doors, kept all those 28 people locked in, 
And uh, I began talking to them. There was a lot of anxiety, a lot of concern about what what do we do now. Six people had died uh, due to anthra anthrax exposure in the weeks prior to the 16th of October. And so there was just an enormous amount of anxiety. Uh, as you can imagine, after 9-11, I had uh, probably the best relationship with President Bush that I've, I've had with any president for that period of time. We called each other back and forth almost daily talking about things. Well, just at that time, he called on another matter, and I told him what had happened, and he was just on his way to a press conference. And so he, uh, at the press conference, uh, made mention of the fact that this anthrax attack took place. And so then we had hundreds of press descending on the office, demanding information. And I was, as, 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 as much as I could, trying to acquire as much family information as I could so I could start calling family members to tell them what had just happened. Um, there was a lot of confusion, a lot of chaos. No one really knew what to do. Um, I went over and, and, uh, and uh, they allowed me to go in, uh, and and because I was I was in there, I I I then had they they were concerned I had anthrax on my clothing. Uh, what was amazing is that uh, they really didn't know what to do. We we kept them there for uh, this happened in the morning. They weren't released until that night, and then they were asked to bring their clothing in a garbage bag the next day back to the hill. And uh, uh, so each one of them brought their clothing for, to, for proper destruction. But there they were, anthrax-laden clothing brought back into the building. And, uh, and so we all looked like refugees. And, uh, but there was a doctor from NIH whose name was Greg Martin, who, was my, who will always be my hero. And, uh, I'm sure maybe somebody in this room recognizes the name. But Greg Martin sort of took control, and uh, he uh, prescribed Cipro for each of the staff for, uh, I, I can't recall now, I, at least 100 days. It might have been longer. Um, and uh, thanks to the enormous uh, professionalism and dedication and care and, and empathy that he demonstrated, uh, we didn't have one uh, serious medical issue in that time. So I was, uh, I'll always be forever grateful. But then the question is, so what do we do? Now we've got this office in the Hart Building that has been contaminated by anthrax. It had gotten into the HVAC system, so they were worried that the spores had spread then to the rest of the building and maybe beyond. So we had to shut down the Hart Building, and it stayed shut down for well over 100 days. I don't recall either the exact number of days, but it was around 100. And then they, they were trying to figure out, how do you detox an entire Senate office building like that? And, and there were all kinds of elaborate schemes that, we, uh, that they presented to me. One was to put a big plastic cover over the entire building uh, and then, and then, somehow uh, kill all the spores in that way. But they they finally came up with a system. But our office had to be totally gutted all the way down to the beams. Everything was taken out. Every single piece of furniture, the walls, the the flooring, everything was taken out. And uh, but uh, over that hundred uh, to 120 days. Um, uh, my office and all the offices in Hart Building had to find extra space. They had to find somewhere to, to go. And I have to say, I, I think as I was thinking about that experience, what a contrast that was during that period from what I witnessed over the last few weeks on Capitol Hill. You had Republicans offering Democrats office space. You had yeah, office machines, staff, anything. It was just the most incredible demonstration of bipartisanship. Of course, we had already seen a lot of it coming out of 9-11. People were announcing on the floor and before the press that they weren't Republicans or Democrats, they were Americans, and we were all pulling together to try to get through this. And that same thing happened with the anthrax attack. It was such a gratifying experience to be able to, to see how 
how closely knit we all became uh, with this attack. So I, I have uh, mixed feelings about that time. I'm, I'm, I shudder to think what could have happened had, uh, had my staff not gotten the, the best care they could. I shudder to think about uh, uh, how much of a tragedy those 28 people might have faced in their lives. And, uh, uh, but then I think with enormous gratitude uh, how grateful we should be for the professionals who responded, uh, for, the, for the kind of attitude um, the senators all exp expressed and, and, uh, and demonstrated, and, uh, and, and ultimately how we were able to get through it uh, as difficult a time as it was. The investigation, of course, began almost immediately. And I think that the one thing you can say with clarity is that there attribution was very, very difficult, uh, a major challenge that we still will probably discuss with some uncertainty for years, if not decades, to come. There were 10,000 interviews on six continents. There were 1,024 preliminary investigations of people who might be responsible. There were over 400 in-depth interviews of those who might have been responsible, 2,700 pages of interview notes. The FBI, after all of that effort, concluded that the person responsible uh, for, for this attack was a man by the name of Bruce Ivins, a, a microbiologist at Fort Detrick, as most of you probably remember. But that conclusion has been contested by some scientists and by investigative reporters. And so there is still a controversy around who it was who we can uh, officially or confidently uh, blame for this nightmare. On the policy front, I would say that we have made some progress. Uh, I look back with some satisfaction at some of the things we did. But I would also say that the theme of this whole day is certainly apropos for any kind of editorial on the policy progress we've made over the last 17 years, fits and starts. That applies in this as well. We passed BioShield. BioShield, in my view, was the single most important way to ensure that we send the right message uh, to the private sector about the importance of stockpiling and countermeasures and the importance of a public-private partnership that we're going to need as we go forward. Advanced funding for 10 years was essential, and we did that, and I think we benefited greatly from it. Unfortunately, BioShield has never been reauthorized, and so we struggle today with replicating that success uh, after the first 10 years. We spent over $60 billion in the first decade, and that was a start as well, and I look back with some satisfaction at how much we, we were able to do with, uh, with $60 billion. Uh, Looking back, 60 billion over 10 doesn't really sound all that significant anymore, but at the time it was really our first major commitment uh, in, in public funding to address our needs uh, more effectively. There is much more heightened awareness in organizational reform, and I would say heightened awareness may be the thing we can look back on with the greatest degree of, of confidence. Uh, Congress has totally revised the way mail is answered and handled. As you know, it's all opened off-site, off-campus, and, and uh, screened and monitored very, very carefully before it gets to a congressional office. We passed in 2006 the Pandemic All Hazards Preparation Preparedness Act, PAPA. That has been, um, I think, uh, as we look back, uh, uh, a very significant contribution in public policy with the creation of ASPR. Uh, and, uh, and, of course, BARDA, with Rick here, it's a clear illustration of the success. And with his leadership in particular, Rick uh, Bright has done an outstanding job. And I'm, I'm so pleased that we've got the capable people working today in these key positions that we're going to need going forward. And, and, and I guess I would just close uh, sharing with my two co-chairs how I look at uh, public policy going forward. There is a lot of unfinished work. And I would list four things in particular. EPA is still not in charge of environmental doc, uh, uh, decontamination and remedi remediation. We still don't have a, 
a, a, an agency uh, that is solely responsible. That was our recommendation uh, number 10, 10B to be exact, when we uh, issued our, our blueprint for biodefense. Um, secondly, there's still no study of those exposed to biological agents. That was 10C. We still have no real appreciation from a medical point of view, from a pathological point of view, uh, and, and I think that's something we really have to have to acknowledge has not been uh, uh, an area that has gotten the necessary priority. Leadership is still, I think, very much in question. Uh, our recommendation, of course, was to, uh, was to, uh, to designate the vice president as our leader in charge, as the person who had the convening authority and had the capacity to reach out to the entire uh, 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 system of, 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 of governance, uh, whether it's legislative, executive, judicial, uh, to, to, to be able to, to, to bring some continuity, some degree of, 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 of balance and, and some recognition of the importance of coordination uh, at the governmental level. We don't have that today. Uh, the, the new bi, uh, uh, Blue Ribbon, all right, the new uh, uh, biodefense recommendation, the, the National Strategic Study, has designated HHS, the Department of Human Services, with that responsibility. And uh, I've been asked many times, is that going to work? I guess we don't know. But I'm certainly willing to give it a, give it a shot because uh, we have Bob Cadlick largely organizing that effort, and uh, I, I can't think of anybody more qualified, more able to, to take on that role than, than Bob Cadlick. So because I have so much confidence in the individual, uh, I have more confidence than I might otherwise have in the institutional approach that people are using, or that, 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 that the, we will be using uh, in this new biodefense strategy. And, and, and finally, there still needs to be a better mechanism for determining attribution. As I said, we have no guarantee. We still have all the answers about what happened, why, and who it was that was the perpetrator. Um, we've made some progress with the FBI and DHS uh, uh, Memorandum of Understanding on the National uh, Bioforensic Analysis Center. That's a good start, uh, but we need an authorization to ensure that that memorandum of understanding can be locked in and that we have the kind of certainty and the guarantee and the confidence that we're going to be able to move forward. So those are some of the things that I think still need to be addressed. There are many others, and that's why I think our recommendations uh, have been uh, have been so critical. We, as, as both of our co-chairs have noted, uh, have a role today that we probably didn't have in 2013 and 14 when we started, and that is to elevate these issues to a greater degree, to advocate where we can, to do as much as possible to, to nudge those and to create a higher priority around many of the recommendations we've made, and hopefully as a result of our work again today, we can do more of that. With that, to my co two co-chairs, let me turn it back to you. Uh, thanks very much, Tom. That was... Uh your recollection of that day in the immediate aftermath I thought was really riveting, and I remember it while I was in the Hart Building, so was also out for that period of 100 days or so. And it was, uh, um, we were in, in some sense in a daze in that period of time, um, but, um, uh, and I think the significance of the anthrax attack in our minds grew over time after 9-11. Uh, of course, there was great fear that it was the beginning of a much wider series of coordinated attacks, um, so th that was riveting. Also, I, th I appreciate very much your um, constructive evaluation of where we've where we've come in the time. We we have about 20 minutes to engage in uh, conversation with Tom, so I'll just begin and then I yield to uh, Governor Ridge. The, the first thing to say is what probably everybody in this room knows is that the bio terrorist threat remains real. I mean, in the sense that we know from publicly available intelligence uh, sources and uh, from statements made that there are nation states that, that have offensive uh, bio uh, weapons programs. And, um, you know, Al-Qaeda and uh, ISIS have made very clear that they're, they're working on such programs and they consider them to be uh, um, a viable uh, offensive weapon. So this, 
that's why I said at the beginning, uh, sadly, uh, we're in, in one of those, it's not um, if, but when uh, moments. Tom, I was really uh, interested in um, the second of your uh, proposals uh, uh, going forward, which is that there really hasn't been yet a study of those uh, exposed to the biological agents. I just want to ask you to go on, uh, if you would, a little bit more about that. I don't know whether you know uh, whether in other cases around the world where there have been biological attacks, maybe some of our ex-officios do, whether there ever been has been a study, and and what you think uh, we how we would benefit from such a study. Well, Joe, I, I I don't know the degree to which this information may be available elsewhere. I, I don't think we've done anywhere near the kind of work necessary to create the medical understanding, the psychological understanding, the maybe even the genetic understanding of what happens to people exposed. Um, you know, and to your point about uh, uh, this likely to occur again, you know, we had a ricin attack uh, less right. than 10 days ago at right. DOD. And so we had, you know, this is not something that's history. This is happening, uh, this is happening now. And yet uh, our ability to, to uh, deal with the issues involving those who were exposed, I think could, uh, could benefit greatly from more research on what are the effects, what, what should we know about the physiological consequences of something like this happening going forward. Um, again, I think, I don't know that anybody disagrees with that. My concern has always been, as we all can testify, I think, uh, my concern is that while there's never opposition, there's just no energy behind it. There's no prioritization. There's no, we, we have so few champions as we commonly lament in this room and on this, uh, on this commission. Uh, we need a champion and one of the champion uh, motivations should be more information, more, more understanding, more application of what we know to circumstances as they present themselves. And I think we could benefit a great deal if we took seriously that recommendation. Thanks, Tom. That's an, that's an important suggestion. And this, uh, it's, you know, I've taken the calling this a commission and not a panel to this commission. That might be something we want to focus on in, in the next uh, chapter of our history. I, I wonder, while we're on this, just briefly, if any of the ex officios want to add anything on this question of studying the uh, impact of um, um, a bioterrorist attack on victims. Uh, if not, oh, uh, Scooter, go ahead, Mr. Libby. So I compliment the excellent presentation. Uh, I was in the White House during during this, uh, and two things stuck out to me beyond the attribution problem, which has already been uh, mentioned. One was that as a defense matter, there was no profile of what this attack was or might be. Uh, and I, I used the word attack, and I, I should correct myself. It was not an attack, really. It was a threat or a warning. I mean, it came in an envelope that said, this is anthrax, go take Cipro, if I recall. Um, so this was not really an attack. An attack would have been much more horrific. Um, but we had no idea what would follow it, which makes it very hard. And the lack of attribution, if you connect that to if it had been a foreign state actor or if the next one is a foreign state actor or a foreign group, which doesn't step forward credibly to acknowledge it, uh, it would be very um, inhibiting to try and come up with a real policy to respond to it. So without real attribution, it's very hard to get, imagine our national debate if the president wanted to strike back at a state that we had 75% confidence to put a strange number on it, uh, had been behind the attack. The other, um, which is humbling, is that there had been four national commissions in the 1990s that focused on this problem. And it said the very words you just used, um, not if, but when, we would have a bio attack, and had very large um, examples. There was the dark winter um, exercise headed by CSIS, um, former Clinton De Deputy Defense Secretary Hamry, um, which did the, found a study with a million dead, which I think we've referred to earlier in this process. So it's humbling to be on a commission focusing on this problem and how do you 
change uh, the results, the non-results that that group had before BioShield uh, came along. They had some use in getting the White House ready. And the third and final point, which uh, Governor Ridge observed, was how slow the bureaucracy was to react under you know, the theme of what you're saying is reactionary. I remember sitting in meetings um, a week or two after um, this, which was five or six weeks after 9-11, um, and the NSC was asking part of the bureaucracy to respond with a timeline to take a certain action that they thought would be corrective. Uh, and the, um, the person from the agency responded, well, I think in two weeks we could get you a memo on when we can really address this problem. Wow. <laughs> so, uh, Governor Ridge, you had to survive through all of that uh, bureaucratic delay, but there's a warning there, too, I think. Uh, <clears throat> thanks. That was very helpful. Governor? Well, I'm glad my colleague was able to share uh, such a personal story with you. Uh, I suspect you think about that often, um, and that your 28 colleagues in that room as well. Uh, I just want to make a couple observations. We can move to the panel, and unless there's other questions from my colleagues. Yeah, please, go ahead. I, go ahead, yeah, I just wanted to address the, uh, the, the excellent point that uh, Senator Lieberman made. First, Senator Deschel, that was very moving, and um, I thought it was really important that you did it that way. And I think that raises one of the reasons why such a study that Senator Lieberman suggested is so important. If you personalize the issue, if you do a study of the impact on individuals, I think it has more political resonance and gets people's attention on it. Uh, I mean, the, the point earlier about, uh, oh yeah, let's uh, let's prepare for something that may happen in 15 years, there's a, there's a last lack of uh, political urgency to doing something like that. But when you present it the way that you have, and also you present the specific impacts on individuals, I think that's important and has value. The second reason is just in terms of prevention for future problems. Senator Daschle, you, uh, you, you quite um, movingly laid out how the entire mail system for how the U.S. government receives outside information has changed as a result of what we saw in that. Perhaps there are other things we can learn from studying what's happened in the past to prevent these kinds of attacks in the future. Anything else? Yes, please. Um, so I was in the Office of Science and Technology Policy at, at the time that the anthrax attacks occurred, and we'll call them attacks, um, events. Um, and there are a number of people in the room who were also involved in trying to develop procedures um, for handling the mail, for sanitizing, which it's not really done, but uh, to some extent lessening the, the threat involved in anything coming through the mail. Um, but the number of steps that were ad hoc that involved developing um, procedures, many, many, many meetings to say, what would it take to wrap a whole building in plastic, like the Brentwood Mail Handling Facility? Uh, the number of distribution centers and mail processing centers that were closed down forever, and the changes in procedure that had to take place as a result of that. We worked very closely every day with the US Postal Service, with Tom Day, and others to figure out what do you do to protect the safety of the mail handlers. Um, and then we, we've talked since then about how the mail system could be used for distributing drugs for treatment of people. So there are all these circles and discussions that took place, but as you pointed out, many of those have not been written in, into, into official or either um, policies, responsibilities. There, we don't have the coordination now that we even had then on an ad hoc basis. Uh, and a number of those have been addressed both in the Blue Ribbon Study Panel reports and also the national strategy to some extent. Um, but there needs to be concrete action that takes place. Yeah, and I would just add one point um, to this emphasis on doing some follow-up studies on these personal effects um, and is to add in the socioeconomics impacts of what these really mean. So there's the personal part about what it does to our lives, um, but there's also a larger component about um, what's it doing for people missing work, what's that doing to local economies, 
on the cost of the recovery, children being out of school, does that set back their education? So when we go into countries like in Bangladesh and look at a disease outbreak um, and really talk to families and what it's done, sometimes it's a generational setback on some of these issues. So I wouldn't just limit it um, narrowly to the affected people, the individuals, but to kind of their broader range of their societal impacts around that group, because those economic costs could be huge uh, compared to the medical cost or just a few days of missing work. I mean, they have big ramifications that we've seen for most naturally occurring disease outbreaks, but even intentional ones that societal effect, travel, trade, um, education systems. Ken? Just one sort of factual follow-up, uh, Senator Daschle. You, you, you highlighted that the 28 of you went home with your clothes that you were wearing that day, bagged them up, you know, back to your homes, your families, then bagged them up and brought them back in the next day. You know, I'm no expert, but that doesn't seem to be an optimal way of approaching this kind of situation. And then just sort of when you think about, as you pointed out, we'd already lost five or six people by that time to anthrax. And this is on the heels of however many commissions in the last, uh, the last decade. Did you get the sense, or was your point that there really wasn't even a protocol for something as basic as that? I mean, they kept, it wasn't like this was a, they only had two minutes to decide this. They had you all day and all evening. I'm just wondering if that's sort of an anecdote that highlights exactly. where things were or weren't at that point. Exactly, Ken. There was, there was no evacuation uh, uh, mechanism. There, there was no thought, to my knowledge, given to just how you address the aftermath of an incident like that. And uh, I'll know, not only did we bring garbage bags filled with our clothing back, we brought them into the Capitol building because the Hart building had been shut down. So we actually brought them into the first floor of the Hart Building. I'll never, I, I go by that room still today, and I, I think, my goodness, we, there we were. I mean, we all had our bags, and, uh, and then they, they just took them all, and I, don't, I guess they destroyed them somehow. But, but it was just a remarkable demonstration of how little preparation had been given, thought given, to just how you address a circumstance like this. And, and uh, I'm sure now there is a protocol, uh, let's hope, but I must tell you, I don't know what it is. Uh, I'm sure there is one, uh, but it would be interesting to explore just how much more detail a plan for n not only evacuation, but remediation uh, exists today. Uh, before we uh, introduce our, our first panel, I want to thank you, Senator. Uh, I'd like to make a couple quick observations, if I might. <clears throat> I guess, Scooter, you and I probably had a couple conversations when this was going on with the Vice President. I always look back to those days, and frankly, the government back then wouldn't had it was post-anthrax, but without the Vice President's support, we wouldn't have gone as deep as we did during President Bush's uh, and subsequent administrations, where we put $60 billion more into the into the biodefense, uh, but that's also a challenge because we put 60 billion in there, 50 appointees relative to somewhere around biodefense, 60, 50 political appointees, billions more money, and we still don't have a unified budget. We still don't have anybody in charge. We really have nobody setting priorities, and that's one of the very reasons, as, as, as challenging as it was for the families that lost loved ones and for the senator and his colleagues to go through that crisis, that's, I mean, that's really at the basis of one of the primary reasons we decided to pull this together, this Blue Ridge panel. And you think about it for a moment, the response historically, it's post-crisis. Well, we just put more money on it. Well, there's more money and there's more political appointees, but you still don't have a budget cut. You still don't know who's spending what on what. The other challenge back then was when right after this crisis, CDC was holding press conferences, and HHS was holding press conferences, and the FBI was holding press conferences, and I think the body politic looked at Washington, D.C. and said, well, isn't there one spokesperson? I mean, is everybody doing their own thing in order to respond to this crisis? 
And with the help of others, we finally pulled everybody into the Roosevelt Room and said, from now on, the press conferences will be conducted from the White House while of everybody giving their point of view and making their public contribution. But the government needs to speak with one voice. And that's kind of a metaphor for the, 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 the Blue Ribbon Commission. We need to have a plan. We need to have a strategy. We need to have one implementation plan. And what is somewhat remarkable about that incident is within the first couple of weeks I was in the White House, I've got the intelligence briefing, and they listed all the pathogens. Now, this is the intelligence community was saying to the federal government, these are the pathogens you should worry about. The nation states have them, the terrorists have them. Well, one was anthrax, so that information had been out there to all these other agencies long before I got the briefing, and yet when anthrax occurred, they're taking clothes and garbage bags back into the, into the Senate building. Or the other happened to be Ebola. Now fast forward 15 years and tell us how, how prepared we were for Ebola. So again, we saw that disconnect way back then in 01 between what the intelligence community was saying about the nation states and the terrorist group and the rest of the federal government. Again, no unified policy, no strategy. We've got plenty of political appointees. We're spending billions, but we're not doing it very effectively. And so I think it just kind of underscores the reason for the Blue Ribbon, the, for this panel, and not that we're breathless about it, we're not alarmist about it, but guess what, folks? Anthrax wasn't a contagion. People forget about that. I mean, we could come up with all kinds of red cells, particularly those of you in the community, if you were advising a nation state or a terrorist organization if you wanted to bring massive death and destruction, a weapon of mass destruction, which could be biological in the United States of America, you don't have to be a scientist in order to figure out what you, how you would want to do it. So I just want to underscore how important it was for us to have Senator Heschel talk to you about that experience. But just flash back to where we were. The intelligence community was telling these other agencies what we ought to worry about, what we ought to be prepared for, but we weren't. Well-intentioned groups from disparate agencies publicly facing, but no concentrated single public message to the general public. And so the panelists over the next uh, couple hours are going to talk to us a little bit about what's been done since then and where we need to go. That's why we asked Senator Dashwood to relive that nightmare in public for all of you. And just as a reminder. Oh, by the way, since that time, we're still talking about if you had to distribute Cipro, how do we get it out there? Now, again... Okay. I'm not sure we got a distribution plan. So there are a lot of things at, at risk and a lot of things that we need to improve upon, but uh, I think our panelists today are going to help us uh, better understand what we've done since that period of time and where we need to go in the future. So Senator Dash, we thank you so much for reliving that nightmare for us publicly. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Tom. I mean, bottom line, uh, what our purpose is to see if we can help b both um, suggest, advocate, push, cajole, and where possible coerce uh, our government and our people to go from uh, reactionary biodefenses to uh, proactive, uh, preemptive, preventive uh, biodefenses. And uh, Tom, you've helped. Uh, us by your recollections, your suggestions in doing that, and the witnesses today, I'm sure, will do the same. By the way, I don't want to. I just have to add a little anecdote. Hope it brings a smile to your face when you're talking about you took had, you're going to take plastic and cover the uh, whole room. I'm not responsible for recommending duct tape there. Trust me. I just I just I just want you all know that that was not that was. Okay, I'm sorry. Some of you probably don't understand that. But it was going to be color coded duct tape, by the way, but that's another story. <laughs>